Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macker, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Coming at you on a, uh, a Monday after the Knicks have played a basketball game. How about that, Apple? For the first time in, um, I don't know when's the last time they played a game, about two months. Uh, welcome in, of course. The man you're all here to see and hear. The, I mean, God, what a, what a run it's been for Jeremy Cohen. Over the last couple of months. I mean, really, let's can we just call the spade a spade. You've had it. Listen, it's been you. You prepared diligently right up all the way up until free agency. And then um, like a, a guy who's been like RJ putting in all the work during the summer, um, it paid off. And you were one of the hottest three point shooters over the end of the season. And um, you were coming out and correct, correctifying folks left and right. It's just it's a it's a beautiful thing. That's all. Oh, thank you. I mean, better to be lucky than good sometimes, which uh, I don't know, just sort of happened that way. But you're so uh, humble. I mean, I'll take it. Look, it it. I'm glad that things are playing out the way they did. Like I've said, there were two paths. Knicks took that I wanted. The Knicks took one of them. I'm very happy with it. I think that there are some great things I will discuss today and and um, in a bit moving forward as well. But no, this is above all, this has just been a really fun week and um, it's been great interacting with people and, and it's just really, you know, I, it just made it all the better. And it was a good week to begin with. So it's just gravy from there. Um, I like and we're, we're going to start the show by talking about Summer League. The Knicks have just uh, finished their opening uh, Summer League game. We're not going to spend too much time on it because uh, if you if you do want to hear. Um, a more extensive recap of the of the uh, summer league game. Uh, check out somewhere else on your feed. My my post game uh, thoughts. Um, but um, yeah, it, I was just going to say it was nice that it didn't start off this way. But by the end of free agency week, for the most part, you listen. There's a billion Knicks fans in the world. You're never going to have anybody on the same page. But for the most part, everybody who roots for this team by the end of this past week was like, okay, I, f- I can, at the very least, I could talk myself into the things that they did. And on the other side of the opposite end of the spectrum, they're like, wow, this was, you know, this was a home run. It, I just, it was nice to be in that kind of environment as opposed to last year when maybe I'm re- misremembering. It did not seem like there was a, a whole lot of consensus and B a whole lot of uh, uh, positivity. I think that's fair. I mean, I, I feel like last summer or not, not even summer because it was November. Yeah, last was, off season, <laughs> oh, last um, I was basically in the camp of like the Knicks made some solid moves, but they didn't make any bad moves. But I also feel like the big thing with that is, you know, like scared money don't make none. And the Knicks could have done other things. Right? They, I thought that they signed a player like Alec Burks with the implicit understanding of, hey, things probably aren't going to go super well because we're just not building the best team. There are a lot of question marks. We can flip him. We know that he's been flipped for multiple. He may have picks. thought that he may have thought that too. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Noel thought I'm playing in a better environment where anything goes. And um, the Knicks had all this cap space to make various moves and they, you know, they didn't do a whole lot. They really got Derek Rose, which is a great move. And they well, got Austin rivers out. They and- did the thing that we th- uh, th- they did the opposite of the thing that we thought they were going to do. Yes, we <laughs> thought that they would. I thought they would be sellers. They yeah. were not. They were, uh, you could call it buyers, but they didn't spend much. I mean, again, that second round pick that went to Detroit, I mean, maybe that turns into a great pick. But also, Listen, man, as I watched Jericho now, Sims, you know, just uh, being unbelievable. Uh, again, so it's Summer League. I get on. it. I know. Any but. day now, Dennis Smith Jr. is going to get that. Uh, who has the most cap space left out there? I'm trying to think. Is there? Is there even? There's got to be a full mid level, right? A full oh, yeah. non tax player mid level. Yeah. One of any any day now. One year, nine point six million. Dennis Smith Jr. Prove it. It's a prove it deal. I don't know who's going to give it to him. Someone. It's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, um, but no, and then and then you just the Knicks are picking a direction and. All these teams in the East are getting better. The Knicks couldn't afford to stick around and wait it out and try to see if lightning strikes twice. And instead they thought, all right, we've got all these guys on movable contracts. We're going to be a better team. That works for us. And um, I, I think they executed that really well. And and can I just say, um, look, I don't know that many Knicks fans left who don't dislike Bill Simmons. Um, 
and he thinks Kemba's done and whatever, but um, it's it was interesting that him and uh, on the pod they did with uh, it was him and uh, uh, Sal, cousin Sal, I think, or one of the guys. I forget. I get all of his guys confused. And uh, Big Wa- Big Was, um, they all agreed that like the path that they took is once you had the season you just had, if you're the Knicks, you kind of have to take this this path. It's like it's it's New York. It's fucking New York. You know, let's just keep the train moving. Um, okay, first, quickly on summer league. So we just saw summer league. Um, I so I just did the post game. I only read the super chats. I did not read all of the comments in the chat, um, and I did not go on Twitter during the game. I sent out a few tweets, but my understanding is that there was much consternation. Love that word. It's one of my favorite words. It's a great word. Over the performance of Emmanuel quickly. Is that is that accurate? Is that fair to say? I guess. I mean, listen, I was streaming the game from my laptop, so I wasn't even on Twitter that much. Okay. Uh, I also like I pretty much just tweeted a few things of my own and uh, I, I really didn't look at my phone or Twitter that much. So then you're that. the wrong person to ask. I'm, I'm definitely not the best person, which is, okay. I mean, great. You know, this is a fantastic conversation we're having of two people who are not on Twitter, <laughs> who are talking about what the reaction was like on Twitter. So, um, but no, I, I mean, I, again, I can understand that some people probably were a little disappointed in, I mean, it seems that he went five of 17 with two he, of 11 from three. He and, started very slowly and got a few late, yeah. but yeah. You know, I mean, for me, again, I don't really care about the numbers for a lot of these guys, unless, of course, it's Obi Toppin doing incredibly well, in which case the numbers are very important. You know, you can work your argument around it how you want to, like how uh, Jericho Sims is, uh, to my knowledge, the only second round pick who is shooting 100 percent from the floor after one game. Uh, and if that's not true, he's the only second round pick who's shooting 100 percent from the floor who was drafted by the Knicks. So, you know, we can we can make this however we want. But again, it's like. I, I, I really don't care about these games. I just want to see some sort of tangible improvement or what I think is, you know, decision-making. Like sure. I would love for Emmanuel quickly to attack the rim more often. Uh, I like the fact that he drives and kicks, but again, like if we're talking about finishing, that's something he needs to work on. Uh, Obi, he hit a, a spot up three from the corner and he's been improving that way. And, it, you know, again, like things that don't really matter, but it's like, no. okay, it's nice to see that they're at least maybe looking at what they weren't super strong at and they're trying to improve upon that. And I think that's really all we need to care about. Um, I'm going to talk out of two sides of my mouth um, or just talk out of my ass, whichever analogy you prefer. <laughs> um, Summer league doesn't matter. Emmanuel quickly going five to 17 does not matter. I'll be quickly. Oh, Obi, Obi quickly. I'll be topping um, going two for 10 from three. Doesn't matter. Um, none of this shit matters. Like Quentin Grimes having a rough, you know, First, okay, although we ended up three, three for eight from deep, like that, don't like take all this stuff with a grain of salt. Um, that said, here's the other, the other side. Jericho Sims, man, that dude, he's gonna play on an NBA court at some point. Um, he's just too big and too athletic, and like the the footwork he showed on offense, I thought was really impressive. A nice little jump hook there. Um, defensively, he seems like I thought it was interesting. Actually, talk about overreacting not only to summer league to summer league practice videos. Practice, talk about practice. Uh, Jeremy, they tweeted out um, how the, the drills that they were doing with Sims were was just verticality, like just like go vertical when the when the guy drives, just go straight up. Um, this from the Knicks Twitter account a few days ago. Um, but like you know, when again, if you're that big and and athletic uh and you have those physical gifts you know if you could do a couple of things like your congratulations you're a backup center in the nba um and you know i don't know that we're going to get to at some point the rest of this offseason well we'll, i'm sure we'll talk about mitchell robinson and the fact that of all the things that happened over the last week uh, one of the things that did not happen was mitchell robinson getting extended um you know it's yeah I don't know. You could get centers and they sign it. And we should say for anybody who doesn't know, they signed Jericho Sims to one of their two way spots, which um, sometimes those, those contracts go to undrafted guys, but also like, I felt like 58th pick to get a two way spot this early. Like that's, I don't know. It's a little bit of a, a show of faith, right? I guess so. I mean, I kind of always assumed he would be shelved as a um, two way guy just because in terms of the, the roster, I mean, with, Mitch and Noel and T- and uh, Taj, it didn't really seem like there was a lot of room for Sims. And 
you know, those roster spots, they kind of add up at a certain point. So, That's true. Um, I, I, you know, I love the fact that he's on a two way and, um, you know, we'll see how he progresses. I, I'm not expecting a whole lot from him, but it's the sort of thing where if your development program is all about getting these guys who are late, um, I, I don't want to say lottery picks because they're obviously not, but lottery tickets in that sense of how once you pass a certain point, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's just so hard to find good talent, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there and it doesn't mean you can't try to work with that player. So with someone like Sims, it's all right. If he's around Kenny Payne constantly because the Westchester Knicks and the big league club practice in the same facility. Yep. Uh, if he's with the team, you know, there are going to be things he's working on. And I mean, let's face it. I don't, I don't foresee the Knicks rolling with Mitch and Noel for the next three plus years. It's like something's going to give. If something happens, is Jericho Sims prepared to even just fill in for 15 minutes a night as a capable backup? We don't know, but that's like, that's really just the ceiling of what I think he could be and what I hope for him to be. Um, And if he doesn't pan out, it was the 58th pick in the draft and that's okay. So I think that's a good transition actually to talking about, what are we're going to spend the most of the rest of the time on, which is kind of like the dust is settled. Um, what are our big overarching thoughts about the off season? And, you know, so I think you think along the same wavelength as I do, which is that process comes first. Um, it's great to get lucky, Right. Who doesn't like getting lucky? Um, it's great to get it's great to get lucky, um, but to as a fan, you you accept the fact that there's going to be hits, there's going to be misses, but as long as you feel like the the team is operating with some kind of a clear pan, plan in mind. Now, obviously, plans are made to or, or what's what's the saying? Uh, best laid plans or whatever. It is. Like you can divert. Okay, it's always like knowing when to pivot is an important skill in its own right, but it's the pivoting should only come after you have a set path. Um, this off season to me evinced a, an organization that still has a very clear purpose and a very clear path forward that they want to take. And like, like the center position to me, you know, it may seem like a, like a small thing. That's going to I want to see what they do with that moving forward, because the, the one thing that got criticized above all else, like you could say, OK, you know, Fournier is was he the right guy? Like that's kind of his going rate. If you're a swing man who could, you know, get upwards of 20 points a game and he could be a secondary ball handler, like you're getting paid close to 20 million dollars a year. You're getting three guaranteed years like Burks. I don't think anyone has a real, real pro- problem with the Burks contract. Kemba Steele. We'll talk about him in a bit. Randall, we'll talk about him mostly next week, but we'll touch on him also. Like the Noel contract. So like they have made an investment in a position that you could clearly get for cheap on its face in a vacuum. It's like, that's too much money for that guy. But at the same time, there's all these other balls in the air. You got the Mitchell Robinson situation. I I don't know if I should call it a situation, but he's on a very cheap deal last year. He'll be unrestricted next year. If they don't extend him, what do they do there? Do they use him as a trade chip? Do they try to extend him during the season? Um, and then you got, they just drafted a kid like Sims. Do they, do they believe like, okay, by the time Noel's deal runs out, we're going to have Noel or uh, Sims sitting there for two more years on a minimum contract where he's going to be able to basically step in and be like, which is, is a very long way of saying as much as we will sit here today and try to be like, okay, this is the grade we're giving New York's off season. Like, we're not going to know today. We're not going to know in a week or a month or uh, quite frankly, we may not even know a, a year from now. Maybe that's a bit much, but like you look over time and see what an organization's path is and, and do they do things that make sense? Um, and like the center position is, is kind of a microcosm of, of that to, to me. It's one thing that I, I'll be looking at. Well, now it's my turn to talk out of both sides of my mouth because I agree <laughs> in the sense of how, you can't, you know, you can't grade the summer, uh, at least not right now. And yet when Randall signed, my natural impulse was this is an A plus summer. Uh, and granted, I had just woken up to this fantastic news and I'll take it. But yeah, I agree. In reality, we just won't know. There's no way for us to figure this out. Um, 
But I think the other big thing here is the Knicks, you know, they created a deeper team, uh, deeper certainly than they had beforehand, um, but all with contracts that can move. Uh, and, and that's at the end of the day, I think the biggest thing. And I know that the Knicks, you know, for some of these guys, the ink hasn't even dried yet, uh, let alone been applied to paper. You know, we still haven't gotten official announcements for any of the free agent signings, except for Deuce, who is a draft pick. Um, yes. Which, can we point out what you pointed out? Um, uh, sure. Uh, so, very smart. Well, you say, it was, you, you tweeted it. Uh, sure. Well, so the big thing with um, second round picks is that unlike first round picks, they don't have any cap holds. They can be signed for really uh, any amount. But um, there's a there's an important piece here, which is that when a team is under the salary cap, they can sign a second round pick for more than two years. But when a team is over the cap, they can't sign a second round pick for more than two years. Even so if whether- it's the same amount of money. Right, right. right. Okay. Uh, yes. So, I mean, they could use the entire room exception if they wanted to for a second round pick. That would be kind of silly, but they could do that. They could sign a second round pick to a minimum contract. But again, it's like they're two years and then that player is a free agent. So the Knicks basically tried to do not that. They tried to, based on order of operations, they signed Deuce first. Uh, and the reality is, you know, with Kemba and the amount that he's owed to him, I highly doubt that the Knicks would have said something like, hey, you know, we're already paying, let's call it a million dollars to Deuce McBride, and then you'll get the rest. And that Kemba would say, absolutely not. I'm signing for everything that you have left. Like, he's not going to do that. He's getting paid by the Thunder to not play for them, and he's going to be a Nick because it means a lot to him to come home. Yeah. So it's smart of the Knicks to lock Deuce into, I mean, terms weren't disclosed, but what I imagine will be a three, four-year contract, mm-hmm. and it works for them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with all these guys, even – once they're officially signed, they just got here, right? I mean, the Knicks are building with them. But if you think that these pieces are, are here to stay, at least most of them, then um, I have unfortunate news to tell you, which is that they're not. And if our entire conversation- And why is that, around, Jeremy? Well, because if our entire conversation revolves around how the Knicks trade for a star, uh, if you're getting someone in, you got to trade some players out. And that's the reality. Uh, and I think that was the one thing where I was reading The Athletic, I want to say yesterday, and they were talking about the Knicks and Julius Randle and it was Zach Harper, I want to say, who was talking about Evan Fournier's deal, saying how, oh, four years, it's just, that's not a great contract. It's not something you want to take on and all that. And I'm just kind of sitting there thinking like, all right, well, let's, let's think about it. The fourth year is a team option. So there's a pretty easy out clause with three years. Um, assuming the Knicks don't make a trade at the deadline featuring Fournier, One of those years is already gone. So you're really looking at if it's a bad contract. And I really don't think it will be unless something, you know, knock on wood, which hopefully doesn't happen to Fournier, but happens, um, that you can move that deal with pretty good ease. Like to me, uh, Fournier could very much be basically the Knicks version of Ricky Rubio, what he was to the Suns, which is like you sign a guy and you're happy with him. But then another opportunity comes along and we really appreciate the time that you were here for, but we're moving you out in the last two guaranteed years of your contract going elsewhere. So it's that type of thinking where I look at this team as currently constructed as the team that's going to play on opening night and hopefully a little bit longer than that. Yeah. These are moving pieces and they have to move because if you want the Knicks to become a contender, and I know you all do, then they're going to have to use these guys and try to trade them as matching salary. Um, I, I'd like to, chime in on the Fournier deal real quick, because, you know, for people who have been watching me all year and and particularly and listening to me uh, in the weeks leading up to the trade deadline, I was pretty consistent in that I did not want to trade anything for Fournier. And the reason I didn't want to trade anything for Fournier was threefold. One um, is I am, was not a believer in trading anything for a player that would come in and not make a difference in what round of the playoffs this team got to this past season um, alone. And because Fournier was expiring, whatever difference he was going to make was going to be for this season. And tied in with that, the second reason is that this team had a really, really nice chemistry. Everybody had their spot. You had Reggie Bullock as the starting wing. You had Alec Burks as the backup point. Um, I didn't think that was worth. And people were like, yeah, it's two second round picks. Well, Newsflash, like 
look at what Brock Aller seems to be able to do with second round picks and, and Walt Perrin and like this organization now. Um, so I did not think of those. And then, you know, I was like, if you want him, just sign him. And then the third reason was I did not think Fournier was, he was not my cup of tea as far as like a primetime guy. He had had some really rough playoff outings. Um, and then that's the one where I've, I've, I'm still worried a little bit on that, but I've changed my tune on this in this sense. One, he was decent for Boston, um, albeit a five game whitewashing by the, by the nets, but still it counted. Um, and it kind of occurred to me that he was the lead wing. I mean, he was not, there's no other word. He was the lead wing for the Orlando magic and all those playoff series. You know, it was like, I know technically he wasn't the point guard, but like, and, and yes, Vooch was the most important offensive player, but like at four, it, it fell on Fournier. That's obviously not a role he is suited for on this team. If everything breaks right, Randall, RJ, Kemba, he's the fourth option. And then the, my main point, which I want to say to you and to the Zach Harper's of the world, you know, I, I like Zach. I think he's been on this podcast. Um, what's the one thing that you could always move. And that's always in demand in the NBA is shooting. Uh, Evan Fournier could shoot. He's always going to be able to shoot. Um, and like, that's a skill that translates. He's 20 years old. Um, like, okay. Is he getting paid $18 million a year or $18.5 million a year when he should be a $16 million a year player? 16 and a half. Like, who cares? It doesn't matter. Like that deal, that deal is always going to be movable, you know? Um, so I, I, I don't have an issue with that. I, I, so do you want you want to do some some fun quick math? Sure, and I'm with you. I think quibbling over two, it's silly. two and a half million dollars. Okay, like we just saw Russell Westbrook get moved to the Lakers, <laughs> and and we thought that deal was like really who's going to take on that contract? So I think it's going to happen, or even well, I'll get to another player when we get to another player. But I'm with you. I think at a certain point it's I, like okay, th- these guys are still movable. Like it's not going to be a big deal. Well, and and it wasn't just the shooting. I thought you were going to say shooting wings, and that yes. even is more so. Like. If you're a great shooter, uh, there's a good chance you get moved. I mean, Buddy Heald is having trouble being moved, but um, but he's, you know, more of a six man. That's not Fournier. Fournier is a starter. Um, he's a shooting wing who starts. Uh, and I, I think there's value in that no matter what. I thought for a second that uh, for, I got excited. I thought for a second uh, Fournier might have 10 full points in effective field goal percentage over Russell Westbrook. He fell, he fell one short, one percentage point short. He's nine Nine percent higher in effective field goal percentage. Love you, Russ. Um, yeah. So, fuck it. Let's let's just do some quick math. So, uh, you want to take a guess at how much Damian Lillard uh, makes next year? Uh, Thirty nine point three million dollars. Thirty nine point three. That's a lot of money, Jeremy. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Jesus. Mm-hmm. How we don't have a player that makes thirty nine million dollars. Nope. No, we don't. Nope. But. Um, so 39 million coming back to us. That means he, that could be up to 125%, right? I'm, I'm, or this is going to come out wrong. So um, it's, it's Dame's salary yes. divided by 125%. Yes. And then minus a hundred thousand. Yes. Which That's gets how you, you get the number, the minimum amount the Knicks would have to send out, which gets you to about what? 32, something like that. 32, 33 ish, something like that. I'm good, but I'm not rain man. Good. It's probably something I'm not. (laughs) It's 31 ish, 32. I'll I'll take your word for it. If you calculate it, I think (laughs) I'll I'll, I'll do, I'll do the math later. So we just said, uh, Evan Ford. And by the way, we should also remind folks, um, that the, any contracts that were, uh, signed, uh, this summer cannot be traded until it used to be December 15th. Is that still, has that changed? Um, I think it's still December 15th, but if it's not, it's January 15th, which let's face it is still a month and a half or so before the trade deadline usually rolls around. So um, it's not going to have much of a consequence. I, I yeah. remember Ariza was traded December 15th that one year. And yeah, so I, I don't very I don't rarely do it. trades happen that early in the, in the season. Anyway, it's like exactly. these things take time. Um, I'm, I'm not saying Dame is going to get traded this season. I'm just, you know, for chits and giggles, because if we're going to sit here and, and praise the offseason for certain reasons, and one of those reasons, the most prominent of which, maybe not the most prominent of which, but a prominent reason of which, and we'll get to Kemba in, in a bit, um, is 
these contracts are, are I always get it wrong. Is it fungible or fungible? Fungible, fungible. right? Fungible. Yeah. Okay. If these, if it's because we're saying these salaries are easily fungible, um, then we should at least go through, through the exercise. So um, 31, 32 million having to go out. Oh, so already I'm looking at salary. So Evan Fournier, 18.1 million for this year. Next salary, Derek Rose, 13.2 million. That might get you very close. Now, obviously, the, the Knicks are not trading Damian Lillard for Evan Fournier and Derek Rose. Probably going to need to be a young player in there. Um, in addition to every draft pick the Knicks um, can can trade, which I believe is six is the total. If you throw in the Charlotte first and you factor in the um, their Dallas pick incoming, which um, allows them to um, do a little finagling with the Stepien rule, which you're not supposed to trade first round picks to use. Anyway, we don't have to talk about that right now. Um, so right there, you're you're like you got your you got. And it, I'm not saying that they, they would trade out Derrick Rose. I don't think they would send Derrick Rose to Portland if he didn't want to go there. Um, I was I forget if we were talking about this or I was talking about this on a live stream or something. Um, I think if they were to ever make a trade in which Derrick Rose would be sent out and Dame Lillard would because it doesn't make sense to have Lillard Rose and t- again, talk about getting ahead of ourselves. It doesn't make sense to have Lillard Rose and Kemba on the same team. Um, if you were sending Rose out in such a transaction, I have to think that they would get him back to his hometown, right? Of Chicago, or they would Perhaps. figure out a way to do that. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I think that if, if it came down to it, it basically was like, Oh, Derek Rose, we don't want to send him somewhere. We don't want to versus like we get Damian Lillard. Then, Derek Rose and the team he's traded to can figure something out. I think they would do that. I don't think Derek Rose would would be an obstacle based on his preferred destination for getting in the way of things. That's just, just okay. my read on it. Um, but I'm with you in terms of basically just cobbling salary together to meet that threshold. And it, I, I'm, I'm going to just say yes, because I have something in mind that I don't want to uh, peel back the curtain for too much with next week's, or at least what I hope will be next week's, uh, yes salary cap thing but um no it'll exactly. be next week that's that's oh, oh i'm just hoping everything we get all the numbers and then i i'm good to go but uh but yeah no it, it, with everything with with the numbers and matching you're exactly onto it and and by the way maybe i spoke too soon we just saw oklahoma city two years ago chris paul dennis schroeder um shea gilders alexander uh dennis schroeder can't shoot um shea was kind of a shooter at that point but like you know, you could, you know, this is the direction the league is going more ball handlers better. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, even Fournier, um, you know, Burks, um, Toppin, you know, that works or, or sorry, Knox, I think maybe, yeah. For Knox would be the guy like again, and all the picks like, we'll see. Ultimately this is going to come down if, if, and when it does come down to an RJ Barrett discussion, um, but we could have that later. So I just wanted to get that out of the way because I Wait, felt like it's important. But very quickly, say? are you saying an RJ Barrett trade discussion or an RJ Barrett discussion about moving forward? And, and if my I am saying. Here's what I think is going to happen. Can I just tell you? Uh, sure. You ready for this? I'm ready for it. It's earth shattering stuff. At some point, we're gonna. It's gonna come out that Damian, like, okay, barring Portland's like coming out of the gate and like having just a really successful season. Which, can we? Okay, I'm. We're really going off the rails. This is what happened when Andrew doesn't. When Andrew doesn't uh, chime in, um, can we go through the West really quick and talk about what are the odds that uh, the Blazers are like decent? Sure. Okay. So the Lakers, um, I don't like Russell Westbrook. You don't like Russell Westbrook. They're going to be good during the regular season. Can we agree on that? Uh, I I mean, I hate his fit with the team. I know you do too, for sure. I don't like Um, it. Yeah. I mean, they'll still be, they'll find a way to be very good. They'll find a way to be very good. Okay. Phoenix. I mean, you know, teams sometimes take a step back, but it is also not the longest of off seasons. Booker. Um, out in in uh, in Tokyo, just won the gold medal. So you never know. But I think Phoenix is going to be better than Portland. Yeah, I do. Okay, Utah was the one seed last year. They got everybody coming back with the exception of Derek Favors. Yep. And I, I think they there. added. Did they add anybody big? I don't think they, they added Rudy Gay. Oh, that's right. They added Rudy Gay to. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, they're going to be better than Portland. Mm-hmm. Denver, big Jeff Green edition. Big Jeff Green energy right now. <laughs> Come on, man. 
They had a lot good. of big threes. They won't play. even have Jamal Murray, and they'll still be better than. Three. I think they'll still be better as well. Okay, um, Dallas. Yeah, Luca is just going to get better. They added not a whole lot of talent around him. In fact, I think it was a pretty disappointing offseason if you're Dallas. And I think the big how, reason. How dare you? Reggie oh, you know. is out there listening to this podcast somewhere right now, Good. shaking his goddamn head. Well, uh, I think Reggie Bullock will be great when he cash and shoots threes. But, and again, like the, the big thing with the Knicks, this is really unfortunate, is I think that Toronto not buying out Gorgon, Goran Dragic is why the Mavs just signed Bullock to the, um, the middle level exception as opposed to using the traded player exception. And that's why for the Knicks, the TPE I was talking about fell through. It has to be it, which is unfortunate. But um, the Raptors are going to keep Dragic, it seems, at least for now. And uh, even though it was a bad offseason for the Mavs, in my opinion, they're still going to be better than the Blazers. If we have time, I want to get back to that because okay. I have a question to ask. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, they're going to be better. Clippers are a wild card, for me at least. I no, obviously, they're not going to have Kawhi, for, if not the whole season, most of the season. Um, Paul George MVP season incoming, John. Look, man, the dude I believe finished it. I, third, I, he finished in third place. What was it, two years ago or three years ago? Three I'm years not ago. being facetious. I'm serious. I think he legitimately, you know, if you look around the league as we're doing and the narratives, because all this is about narratives. It's all about narratives, baby. If, if you play well and you don't have Kawhi and you're like a top four seed and you are having the season that you were having last year, but a higher usage, so your numbers are up a little bit, easily. He could easily be the candidate, so... But yeah, that's we're up to what five five teams now, right? Well, we hold on. Lakers, we Suns. Lakers. We, we're up to six teams. Six teams. Six teams. Okay, teams we did. Oh my god, the Warriors. Mm-hmm. Clay's Maybe. coming back. Yep. Um, Jonathan Kuminga is not going to help them at all. <laughs> Maybe John, maybe John Wiseman uh, learns how to play basketball. Um, no, but I think we could. We, uh, uh, Iggy is coming. They're running the whole band back. Yep. Um, I'm putting the Warriors ahead of the ahead of the Blazers. As am I. Okay. Um, now, now we're getting into some some fun times. Okay, so the Grizzlies. I think so. Why not? I I don't know. They got they so they swapped out Valanciunas, who was good for them. For Steven Adams, who I it's still think is pretty good. Um, I don't think the lack of I think they'll be fine with Steven Adams. Jaron Jackson Jr. coming back. John Morant, you're three. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I I'll put, I I think I'll I'll join you in that. Okay. Yeah. They're a playing team. That's and that's fine. But I think they'll be better than the Blazers. Okay. They also, worth pointing out, play in what I think is a weaker division. Yes, they do. And division, and you're gonna go back to having most of the division games. And mm-hmm. then you have some wild cards here. San Antonio, New Orleans, my God. I, I'm so rooting for New Orleans to be the worst team in the league next year. It's, I am too. It's going to be great. Um, San Antonio, New Orleans, Sacramento, Minnesota, uh, Houston, and Oklahoma City are, are not going to try to win games. Um, I mean, it it would surprise me if the Spurs, Pelicans, Kings, or, or Wolves were better than the Blazers. It would not shock me. No, I think they'll be a playing team, ultimately. So, but but there's seven, eight playing, and then there's like nine, ten playing. Right. If so, okay, very very long winded way of getting to. <laughs> Come on, it's a worthy discussion. No, it was good. We had to have it. We had to have At it. Some that's point. Necessary. We're having it now. Yeah. Might as well. There's no better time than present. Um, With no Andrew, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait. I want a camera on Andrew's face as he's listening to this to edit it in post production. Yeah. Um, so. Here's what I think is going to happen. We're going to get to the I don't know, 30 game mark, maybe. Um, the Blazers are going to be sitting there at 14 and 16. They're going to be vying for that 10 spot with the Wolves, Anthony Edwards, big, big sophomore energy, Anthony Edwards. Um, D'Lo, bounce back season for D'Lo. Um, and we're going to, it's going to come out and someone's going to report it like, Dame has requested a trade and he's, he wants it's to be to Henry Abbott <laughs> and I no don't one will believe him. Because... A one-on-one with exclusive yeah. to true. <laughs> um, <sighs> they're going to hire Yusuf Nurkic as the guest interviewer for this. Um, anyway, uh, go subscribe to true. G- great, great newsletter. Um, so, and it's going to come out and it's going to be something like, and he has, and his list is 
Well, and this is where it gets interesting because the Knicks, are, I, I think the Knicks are going to be on the list. The question is how many other teams are going to be on it. I think the, the Philly situation with Ben Simmons all ties into the Dame thing because if they don't move Simmons or they move him, maybe they move him for something else that could be traded for Dame. I don't know. That bears watching. You know, the Warriors, does Dame even want to go to that team with those guys and like join up with Steph? We have no idea. I'm sure there'll probably be another team or two, but I think it's going to come out and I think it's going to be, and it's not inside information. This is just what I think is going to happen. Um, and then at that point, we're going to have the RJ discussion because at some point it will leak that like the Blazers want RJ and all the picks and more young players. And then the Knicks will posture and they'll be like, well, no, you're not getting all. And then it'll be whatever it's going to be. That's how I think it's going to go. That's fair. I, I will save my theory for next week. Um, but I, don't I didn't think, think it had to do. Well, you said what next week's topic is going to be. I didn't I, think this well, had to do with that. I, hey, I've always got something up my sleeve now, don't I? But <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, 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 could see, I could see the direction of that. And, and I agree. At a certain point, there will be a breaking point for team. It's whether it's at the trade deadline at the end of the season, in the off season, whatever. But, but yes, I, I agree. The point, and and going back to it, the Knicks have those contracts where they can make the, that type of move. They can make other moves, including that type of move. So, um, yeah, that's that's really the long and short of it. But I, I think the the one thing in terms of like with the Knicks as well, the contract that bothers me the most, and and it doesn't even really bother me that much, is with Nerlens Noel, knowing now that the third year, non guaranteed. But yeah. uh, but it's really again, it's like. At worst, let's say he lasts the whole season. It's one year, really, that that you have to worry about. Um, yeah. For, for Plumley, right? He just got traded with the 37th pick for the 57th pick. I mean, Unbelievable. New I, Orleans I, Noel is a better player than, than Plumley is. I'm astounded by that. I was astounded I, by that I trade. I know. Well, I mean, you know, fine. like Michael Jordan and, and white big men. Find a more iconic duo, I dare you. <laughs> Like it, it, that's just always how it's going to be, I guess. But the, the the point with him is that Noel, I think you can get better value for him than that. And that like Plumlee has two years left on his deal. You're telling me that Noel at two years is going to be worse than what that was, which I mean, if you're Detroit and you're trying to unscrew yourself from this bad contract that you gave him, then I mean that you do that. 11 times out of 10. That is perfect. That that gets you out of whatever situation you box yourself into. Um, so I, I don't see the Noel deal as being crippling. No, it's all not. of them. They're, they're all, they all have solid exit strategies. And I think that is the most important point is that things come up. And if you need to part with these contracts, it's like, okay, cool. You want New Orleans Noel for two years? You can have him for two years. You want him for one year? You can have him for one year. Uh, same thing with Alec Burks. Same thing with Derek Rose. And then to a lesser extent, because of Evan Fournier, just tack on another year. And there you go. So, um, again, I, I think that – and then when you factor in Kemba as well. Well, let's – can we talk about Kemba? Sure. Let's talk hey, about Kemba. We, we've been we've been burying league. So, I have not really heard your – your. Um, well, no, we did the live stream, but I've, I haven't – we haven't talked about Kemba since we did the emergency live stream. Um, I – this is – this is the most fascinating thing to me that has happened to the Knicks in such a long time, which may sound like a random thing to say, but like there's downside, right? There's that like the knee. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, if you read, if you, uh, if you subscribe to the guy that uh, Mark Berman pulled out from under a rock, who uh, apparently does things for a living that have to do with knees. Like you'd think that like, uh, you know, maybe Kemba's going to go out there on opening night with a walker. Um, but at the same time, this is a guy who averaged 30 points a game on efficient shooting over the last like seven or eight games of the la of last season before the playoffs. And I, I've been watching some of those um, like the some of that tape. He looked sure looked good to me. So I like there's a ceiling here. Where I'm just like I, I try to be good about not allowing myself to like fantasize too much about upside, but like man, if he comes out, and granted they're probably going to play him, you know, or not going to play him on second night of back to backs and the whole thing, but if he comes out and he, it looks the part, and my goodness gracious, if there is a co I, say what you want about Tibbs, right? The man has faults. We we've discussed them all year. Still one coach of the year. 
if there is a man who extracts the most water from every rock that he gets, it is Tom Thibodeau. So as opposed to Brad Stevens in the last two years of Boston, who the more we learn about that situation, who the hell knows what was going on over there? I, I'm, I'm starting to get a little irrationally excited. That's all. That's all I want to say. Well, I guess the first thing I'll say is in terms of Kemba's injury, I mean, like, there's a reason why if he gets hurt and, and he needs some assistance, why his name is Kemba Walker, you know? Uh, the second thing, of course, is I feel as though with Kemba, I agree with you, you know? Like, I, I really think that the upside is right there. I, I was very much against the idea of taking on Kemba on his max contract, but, you know, the, the, the knee, of course, yeah. uh, the height, the, the size, I, like uh, so many different factors where it's like, I feel very uncomfortable with the idea of having him on the roster and restricting what you can do, uh, which is why I thought, okay, Kemba's coming in a trade. Then I find out, oh, it's a buyout and it's going to be for what? Around $8 million. That's a risk I'm going to take. And when you look at the market, uh, what else were you really going to do with that money? Because Dennis Schroeder, who a lot of fans <laughs> did not want, myself included, yourself included. Can I just uh, tell you how? And then Reggie Jackson. Who, how happy. <laughs> I, I'm thrilled too. I know. It's great. Um, and the fact that he might sign in Boston, I think would be. Shep's oh kiss. my God. But uh, they have to clear some money because they're near the tax line. But anyways, in terms of um, with Reggie Jackson, I mean, why is he leaving a, probably the similar role and for a better team uh, and less money by coming to New York? It, it wasn't going to work out. So, when you when you figure out that that's what the the play is, Kemba for eight years, eight million dollars, two years, uh, eight, a year, I guess you say, that's totally worth it. And, yeah. and again, like Kemba to me, it's not like he's untouchable because he's coming here. If there's the opportunity where you need to use his salary as well, you can still say, hey, you know, there's a great homecoming. It was a means to an end. We're really glad we got him in here, but we have bigger plans, and that's fine. Um, but ideally, you know, you want him to be a lead guy. And Prez uh, on, on Twitter, uh, he tweeted out something about Walker's uh, uh, B-ball index scores. Yeah. And the Celtics really made life hard for Kemba Walker. His shot so. selection was just really terrible, like graded F and D plus bad. Um, so long. it's not. So if the game could be made a little bit easier by having, um, I guess you could say, better talent. I mean, I'm very high on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown's great, but well, the idea of having how about functional, know, functional fitting right. talent in a, in a lineup that makes sense and as, emphasizing their strengths, which yes, thank you. That was not what happened with Kemba. So, you know, trying to get you know, what's going on here. Like it's not Tibbs getting blood from a stone. Kemba can give you more than that, but his value was so depressed because of how Boston played him and his knee as well. So I'm cautiously optimistic but it's the sort of thing where it's like, yeah, how many other guys were, were realistically attainable? When we were talking about realistic free agents, or at least thinking about it, uh, and like what this season would be as a, this offseason would be as a success. Mm -hmm. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought, oh, Kemba Walker gets a buyout, signs with the Knicks. Not even on the not even on the radar. Right. Because we were and, thinking maybe John Wall buyout. That was what we were always right. getting asked about, right? Exactly. What if the Rockets buy John Wall? The Kentucky and connection like, and all that. Yeah. I'd I know. Like, no, I still don't want to. <laughs> and because the whole thing with, with the free agent market was okay, it's Chris Paul, it's Kyle Lowry, it's yeah. Mike Conley, everyone else. And the Knicks weren't getting any of those three guys. So I'd throw Lonzo. There was a lot of Lonzo Ball. Who, but again, and, and I, Spencer, I don't see him I, as a point guard. You, yeah. And, mm -hmm. And Dinwiddie, I think, is still... There's injury injury concern also. Yeah, yeah he, who also has torn his ACL twice. So, again, like... You're, you're getting an injury concern for one less guaranteed year mm -hmm. and for $16 million instead of $60 million. Right. Yeah. So, it's worth it. It's 100% worth it, and I'm really glad the Knicks took that direction. I, I see I see where it could go wrong. I see all the avenues well, where it could go wrong. But I don't think that where the Knicks would go wrong is so disastrous to the point where it's like, well, we're screwed. And now what are we going to do? And like seeing some some replies about how ha, ha, the Knicks are going to be locked into the fourth I, through seventh seed through eternity. What the hell are you talking it's, about? It's, it's, that's ridiculous. The Knicks, to me, the Knicks didn't give up anything this summer, right? They're, they did cap space. That's how they basically and got everything can I just, hold and on. they didn't they didn't trade any future first yeah even added one because they felt hey it's not going to be of good use here right now so if you're the knicks and you're adding more picks and you're adding talent you're turning cap space into assets that you can flip or keep 
how do you expect the Knicks to be this like low ceiling team that's just going to be on the, the pretender treadmill forever when they're just taking steps? Because really, to me, it was like, how, what were the Knicks supposed to do, right? Because they weren't going to land any of the point guards. They weren't going to land Kawhi Leonard. They weren't going to make a trade that, that handicaps them and shortens their ceiling because the Blazers don't want to trade Damian Lillard and no one else seemed to want to go because we didn't see any of the big names move. So what? Then the Knicks basically kick the can down the road for another year and then basically do what the Celtics are doing, which is, oh, you know, we got some talent in the building, but we really hope we can make it work and attract our, you know, this star to come to where we're at. When we just saw with, Kyle Lowry, he looked at the Miami Heat and saw that they did not really have cap space. They could create some, but they figured out a way to make it work. And that, to me, is the biggest thing. With sign-in trades, you can make a lot of this shit work. Can I ask these people a question? you need to be talented enough to to take that leap. Yes. Yeah. That last part. (laughs) Step one. Step one. Be good to make the guy, whoever your guy is, be good enough to make the player want to come. Guess what, folks? In the NBA today, there is no step two. Because if you're talented enough, and oh, let me rephrase that. Would everybody like to go to the Lakers? Yes. Here's why the Lakers, well, actually, the Lakers did kind of make it happen with Russell Westbrook because <laughs> they cobbled together salaries. But like, here's why the only situations where it doesn't work like that, where it's like, oh, the guy wants to go there. Oh, they can't make it work is when they already have superstars on max salaries there. Those are the only situations where you are hamstrung because of salary restraints. It has nothing to do with cap space. Let me ask all these people a question. Do you think for a millisecond, if we get to next summer and Zach Levine wakes up one day and he's like, you know what? I'd like to go play for Tibbs again. I had a fun time that one year before he traded my ass to Chicago for Jimmy Butler. I, and I'm being facetious because Levine has actually had very kind things to say about Tibbs um, after he was traded. Do you think for a millisecond that he's not going to find his way to New York? It's just going to be a matter of what do the Knicks give up to Chicago to facilitate a signing trade. And And, yeah, yeah. with Levine, right. He's going to look at the team and he's going to say, okay, so I can force my way there. And look at how the Knicks are emphasizing Evan Fournier. Look at what they're doing to make him look good and I'm a better player than Evan Fournier and I can fit into that type of role and I can be, I can bring the team up to another level. That's yes. the type of thinking where if you're a star, like if you're looking at Alfred Payton and you're Damian Lillard and you're gonna be like, okay, well, I mean, he's clearly not a starting point guard, but if you look at Kemba Walker, if he's able to rehabilitate his game and at least be productive and look good under Tibbs, you're thinking, Oh my God, like, I can do that. I can do that even better than Kemba Walker's doing because I am an elite player and Kemba Walker is a former all-star who, yes. who's, you know, hoping to recapture some of his best glory days. And, and I don't mean that as a slight for, for Kemba. It's no, just, it's not. It's not a slight. Where we're at. And, and, so, and if so you, showing how you can, how you can elevate this team, that is why it's so important. And again, like bringing back Reggie Bullock on a one, like if you ran it back with everyone on a one year deal and try to do the same thing, like, Again, it's like, okay, cool. They have the cap space. I could sign there. Hypothetically, sure. But you're finding guys who are more, more multidimensional than Reggie Bullock, than Alfred Payton. And you're bringing them in the building and you're well, banking Bullock on- Bullock wasn't coming for one year, by the way, obviously. Right, he was. He's got three years from Dallas. Yeah, and good for him. But you're banking on internal development and, and you're hoping that it's not just lightning in a bottle once, as I said, and, and no regression from some guys and all of it. Just It's a wing and a prayer. And instead, you're looking at it. You're saying, this is a better team. And they have the resources to get better. And I can help do that. And it just, it's step by step. So that's why to me, it was like, it's so hard to categorize this off season because realistically, what would have been great? Like if you said, Hey, let's say a month ago, this is the off season, right? The Knicks are going to get Kemba on the cheap. They're going to get Evan Fournier. They're going to resign yep. a lot of their key rotation guys. Um, Unfortunately, they're going to let Theo Pinson go. You'd probably say, "Not happy about that." Oh my God, I can't believe the Knicks let Theo Pinson go. And I would agree with you. I, I think that's just very sad. It but, is sad. But you're also going to look at it and be like, "That is a markedly better team." And I guarantee you that when the time comes next season, if the Knicks are playing similarly to how they did, 
then it's going to look really nice. And it's be like, wow, the energy is coming back. This team is still on the up. And, and that's the, the key, ammunition though. to take that next step. But that's the key. You needed to keep the energy because the one thing the Knicks could not afford this season were to be like, oh, yeah, that one year, that was nice. It's too bad. It's not happening anymore. It's that's and that is why that is why if and when and again, getting way ahead of myself, if and when it's Levine or Beal next summer, um, who who I'm trying to think if I'm missing anybody. No, it's basically just those two guys. That's it now. I mean, Curry's yeah, off. And exactly. Curry's off the market. Um, it, well, Kyrie's still out there. Anybody <laughs> want some Kyrie stock? I'll, I'll pass. Um, but if one of these guys, it's it's a sign and trade. I don't want to hear anybody sitting there saying like, oh, if they hadn't done those stupid signings, then they would just be able to sign the person with cap space because um, and now, you know, it costs them whatever, a first round pick or a couple of first round picks. That's not how it works. You need to keep the foot on the gas. That's why they needed to make these signings. You cannot have your cake and eat it, too, in this situation. You need to pick a path. And they did. Um, and again, that's and, and and you know what? What else? You have not banked your entire organizational future on man. Hope this guy decides to take our money. You know, as we learned, it's not a it's it's not a sustainable plan. Um, OK, last thing. I want to ask you before you uh, two things before we get out of here. One, in terms of the announcement of the signings and whatnot, um, I don't I, I, I should have told you before I put you on the spot like this. Well, I don't know. So I'm admitting I don't know. So it's not bad if you don't know. Um, I the Vildoza doesn't Vildoza need to get waived and re-signed into the two into the room exception. Pretty much. For, if the next fran- one Financially. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the number that's been floated around with Kemba where it's is eight or nine dollars. Yes. And it's like, OK, well, how are the Knicks supposed to make that work? Because I like if that's the thing, they really only have about five million dollars left to spend when you factor in Vildoza, which is why I am very much in favor of waiving Vildoza and then signing him to the room exception, which you can do um, because of the fact that with that situation, you're creating the money that you need. And what you're saying to Vildoza is, hey, guess what? Um, we're going to cut you, uh, not physically, of course, but from the team. We're going to wave you from the team. We're going to shank you so hard, Luca. Um, you, you basically get rid of his salary. And as a result, you say, but it's good news. Uh, we're going to pay you a little bit more because we can pay you up to $4.91 million and we'll give you the full amount. We're also going to try to get you on a team option for the second year, which is a little over $5 million. Uh, And good news as well, because on the current contract, you are probably going to enter restricted free agency two years from now. But instead, you're going to enter unrestricted free agency, which means if you get really good, you can do whatever you want. And I think that's going to be the selling point. And I think as well with Vildoza, I want him to stay based on the fact that we're talking about Kemba, we're talking about Derek Rose. But if something happens to either of those guys, then all of a sudden you're left with Quickly and McBride. And having quickly McBride and Vildoza, again, like it, it's still a live body. It gives me more. Um, I, I'm calmer as a result, knowing like even if you have five guys who can handle at the point, that's fine. That's really I, okay. I have a not a theory because I, I literally just thought of this. Um, I wonder if there is in a world where, let's say, he doesn't maybe have the, the best summer league showing. Um, again, first rule of summer league. Don't don't worry about summer league. Um, I just wonder if they were to if they like went to him and were like, look, when we signed you last year, we didn't know what was going to happen this offseason. Now we got Rose back. Obviously, Kemba's our guy. You're going to be the third string. You might be the third string point guard, but at the same time, just keeping it 100. We're going to give this kid Deuce a chance in camp to maybe win that job, and if he wins it. You know, would you rather us wave you now um, so you at least have a chance to go catch on either with another team or go back to Europe or whatever it is? Meanwhile, the Knicks aren't going to do that unless they have a backup plan. I wonder if there's someone sitting out there who they would they would want. Um, oh, my God. How wild would it be? If they did that and they signed Frank to the room exception, I was going to say, how year. badly do you want to say Frank? I, I mean, it's but it, he, honestly, is he is he the best other than Schroeder who put in his own category? Is he the, like the best 
free free agent point guard available on the market right now? Uh, he's up there. He's on. He's on the he list. He is, but I think that's more a sign of the market. I think Frank again. It's more of a that off ball wing. I mean, we saw it in the games where he was starting at the point position. It was just the yeah, offense no, was I know. even I know. as an emergency backup. That's what he was, and it was, still was not good. But, but he would go I, back to being like the eleventh or twelfth man on this team, which is what he was last year. Right. And listen, I would love to see Frank back. I just think it's it's more likely that the Knicks basically try to save Bulldoza. I, hey, I we'll, we'll do that route. Or if they dumped him, it would be to, I don't know, a team like Oklahoma City, and then that's that, and then the Knicks use the room exception on someone else because okay. they could dump him into a, a TPE that OKC has. Um, the last thing, um, I just want to get back to the, the Bullock thing uh, because you mentioned that we, we both what we, we we I was texting you this week about if if it was a Bullock sign and trade because um, I I was there was some there was some Miles Turner I don't I don't know what do you want to call it not scuttlebutt but like there was a video of him practicing with Julius Randall and like uh, a reporter from the Indy Star reported that like the Knicks were hot after Miles Turner my my crazy theory was that the Knicks would what was it. The Knicks would send out Reggie Bullock in a sign and trade. Um, I think I texted this to you as well as Knox. I think I, I think in this theory, I had Knox going to like Indiana or something. So they'd be sending out about $15 million in salary, 16, 15, 16 million. Turner would be coming to the Knicks. Mitchell Robinson. I think I had in this one going to Dallas and then Brunson going to Indiana. I think was what I could, maybe there's picks being exchanged too. I, I don't, I didn't really think it through that much, but that was what I came up with in terms of like the, the Bullock sign and trade. And then it results in them getting Turner. Did, I just wanted to tell you that I didn't really have a question. Yeah. Well, that's fine. <laughs> but, and then unfortunately it wouldn't have worked because of base year compensation. Okay. Um, with Turner having too high of a salary and Bullock's wouldn't have counted quite as high the amount for the 10 or so counts million. for the, it counts for the lower amount for the for the team sending it out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it wouldn't have. It unfortunately wouldn't have worked. But but exactly, that's the the type of thinking at least where you're trying to go about that way. Because the Knicks, but the Knicks would have needed to only get up to thirteen million. Right, but they'd still have to sign Kemba. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, this went out the window once the Kemba thing and, and he yeah. took up the rest of the space because then you needed Bullock's cap hold. But like, yeah, that was my, I think I thought of that at two in the morning. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we did this one justice. Uh, Jeremy Cohen, anything else on your mind? Uh, no, I just want the, I want all these transactions. I want these numbers. I want to rock and roll with what we got and see what these amounts are so so I can better plan and so we can have fun. But uh, no, this is, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I'll just say this, right? I, it seems silly to, to think like, oh, I'm walking on air because of these signings, right? Like they're not these incredible signings, but there's something about it where I feel like, I don't know, I, a lot of the times the hat I'll wear is a Knicks hat and I just feel a lot more pride and there's, a more, there's more of a bounce in my step or a pep in my step after this week. And it, I, I know that, these deals are not going to be life changing. And I know that it's probably going to wind up with the Knicks being about in a well, similar position. You where don't they know were, that. They, listen, right. if somebody told you they were the, they were fighting for a three seed after 30 or 40 games with that, I mean, it wouldn't shock you. It wouldn't shock me, but it's more like, again, my, my, I guess my hope is, I mean, a championship, but my more realistic goals, like, Hey, just look better in a first round like you're a competent team and you've taken that next step forward. Yep. Um, and if it results in a playoff series win, then that's even better. That's, that's great. But just with, with everything and how the Knicks are now where they've turned, they turned a, a <laughs> just a rag tag team on a budget into something that was compelling and then turn what was compelling into something better. It just, you keep going up and it's so hard to see what the top of the mountain is right now, but it's easy to get a glimpse as to what it could be. And it's exciting because they're patient, they're prudent, they're doing the right things. Uh, they have my seal of approval for whatever that's worth. I don't know if that matters to any of you. I don't know if your eyes lit up at something else or no, at me. Vo Vorkanov just tweeted, the Blazers are running out of lineup for, for Summer League of Emmanuel Moutier, Michael Beasley, and Kenneth Fareed. See, that to me would be the stuff of nightmares, but I'm glad we don't have to deal with that. Um, so why? 
Exactly. Um, which I guess then could lead us to the fact that, again, like these probably this won't have any effect on Dame. But at the same time, him saying, uh, you know, like wasn't the offseason we'd have hoped for. Um, yeah, I mean, you basically had Norman Powell say to you, either I walk or you pay me. And if I walk, that looks terrible. And, uh, you know, they, they whiffed on Kelly Oubre Jr., I guess, even though they didn't have the money that Charlotte did. Just not a good off season for Portland and they really didn't have many options. And my conspiracy theory. Ooh, I love conspiracy, Jeremy. This is great. Right. Uh, so John, did you happen to see uh, the NBPA that they had elections recently? That would be Mr. Uh, CJ McCollum. Congratulations. You are the new president of the uh, national basketball uh, players association. Right. So, I mean, we know that Chris Paul was, dealt from Houston to OKC. So it's not like teams are going to be completely um, just like ruthless when these types of things happen. But don't you think politically it's just a little bit, just a little bit harder to move CJ McCollum somewhere that he really doesn't want to go because of the fact that it's like, oh, hey, that's our (laughs) union president. And you just treated him like crap and sent him to a destination that no one wants to go to. That sort of thinking. Again, I I don't think it'll really matter in the long (sighs) run, but But it makes it just, I feel like it's a stickier situation now than it was before he was elected. It's, I mean, we could do a whole other podcast on (laughs) a a CJ McCollum, Ben Simmons uh, trade discussion. And what does Portland need to throw in? Does, does, like, does does, does Portland even want, does Dame want that? If you're Dame, would you want to play with Ben Simmons? I have no idea. Um, Okay. That's a conversation for another day. This was great. Jeremy, uh, really just again, Masterclass over not only this week, but the preceding weeks and months leading up to this. Um, it was your time to shine, and you, man, it's like the sun. The sun is the sun is not a planet. The sun. The sun is a star. It's true. And for once, when it comes to the sun, I didn't get burned. So I was happy about that. It's almost as good as the Walker one. <laughs> that was good. All right, everybody out there, uh, don't forget check out the uh, check out Nick's Films with YouTube channel if you want to uh, see any of our stuff, uh, any of our shining faces. If you're if you're listening to this on a podcast, uh, patrons, uh, our, our Patreon is up and running. We had our first town hall last week. We're doing the the bonus pods, obviously. Um, that that come out every week. Uh, we're going to be and pretty soon for our people in our highest tier. You're going to get to be right here with us during a live recording of the Knicks Film School podcast. That is happening very soon. If you are a a Ewing tier patron, um, stay tuned. You're going to get information on that very soon. I promise. I think that's it. All right. Um, Everybody have a great week and uh, we will talk to you soon. Good evening.